This video discusses reconstruction from 1865 following the Civil War until the election and compromise of 1877 when it ended. So what was reconstruction? It was an attempt to achieve national reunification and reconciliation after the Civil War and to improve the status of former slaves. The reality was that both of these goals were very difficult to satisfy and many historians say that the North prevailed during the Civil War and won that. However, the South is what who is going to win re Reconstruction. Following the Civil War, there were four main questions that needed to be answered. How would the South be reintegrated? You had 11 states that had left and formed their own country, and they needed a process for bringing them back into the United States. And another question was, who would control this process? Would the Southern states be able to control the process? Would it be Congress? Would it be some other body. Also, the South needed to be rebuilt because much of it had been destroyed. And the final question was what would be the condition of African Americans in the South? They had been slaves for such a long time that there was a question of how do they transition to a new lifestyle. Rebuilding the South, Richmond, Charleston, and Atlanta had been destroyed during Sherman's march. Economically, the South lay in ruins. Banks had been ruined by runaway inflation. Factories had been closed or destroyed, and the transportation system was devastated. Agriculturally, the cotton fields were now just fields of weeds. Livestock had left. They were gone after the northern invasion. And the agricultural output did not return to 1860 levels until 1870, and much of this will be from a new southwestern area. And finally, the planter aristocracy had lost complete value in money because the slaves' value had disappeared and many of their mansions were destroyed or ruined. The question became what to do with blacks in the South. First of all, slavery was officially abolished through the 13th Amendment. Remember that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't end slavery for anyone because it was only for slaves in rebellion against the United States. And so the 13th Amendment is the one that will say that there should never be slavery or involuntary servitude. Next, the Freedmen's Bureau was created in 1865 by Congress, and members included many Northerners, including former abolitionists who had risked their lives to help freedmen in the South. The purpose was to help unskilled, uneducated, poverty-stricken former slaves survive. They Goals included providing food, clothing, medicine, and education to them, including the fact that 200,000 blacks were taught to read. Many of the people, once they were free, were eager to read the Bible because they had for so long believed that the Bible was their savior and that the afterlife, and now they wanted to be able to read it for themselves and not just hear about it. They also negotiated labor agreements between freedmen and planters. They were authorized to provide 40 acres and a mule they would do this from confiscated or abandoned lands. And in many areas, um, there was no distribution of land at all. Sometimes they even collaborated with planters in getting rid of blacks from towns and forcing them to sign labor contracts to work for their former masters. So it didn't work very well. Southern violence happened against these so-called carpetbaggers who were these Northerners who came South after the Civil War. And anyone aiding African-American rights in the South often was a victim of this violence. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. The Bureau will expire in 1872. President Johnson had tried to kill it repeatedly. He was a white supremacist, along with most white Southerners, and wanted to get rid of that. And then finally, the 14th Amendment, which we will talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, but it will gain, it will primarily grant citizenship to anyone born in the United States which will be a change to birthright citizenship. It will also include equality under the law. There are three different re reconstruction plans to be familiar with that all have similarities. Two of them have similarities. Um, Lincoln's plan was called the 10% plan. And this would state that 10% of former Confederate States voters in the 1860 election. So they would figure out how many people voted in 1860 and 10% of them would need to pledge loyalty to the United States and um, obey emancipation or support the 13th Amendment to be reunited. The next step would then be to create state governments, which Lincoln would then recognize them as, as an official state. 
There is a group of congressional Republicans who will reject this 10% plan, saying it is too lenient and that it does not safeguard the union gains. And these, this group will be known as radical Republicans. The Wade Davis bill will be passed by Republicans in 1864 and will require 50% of states voters from that 1860 number to take an oath of allegiance and also impose stronger safeguards of the 13th Amendment. States then would have a constitutional convention that would require approval by the federal government. And they believed that the Confederate states had forfeited all their rights by leaving the Union. And so they were now an acquired territory that should be treated totally different than other states. And they should be readmitted only as conquered provinces subject to certain conditions. Lincoln vetoes this bill. And in response, the Republicans refused to seat delegates from Louisiana, even after it had met the requirement of Lincoln's 10% plan in 1864. Two congressional factions will emerge among the Republicans. The majority will be moderates who will support Lincoln's plan and believe that the Confederate states should be reintegrated as soon as possible. Let's get on with it and just let the past be the past and move on with the future. However, there will be a minority radical group who want the South's social structure to be uprooted and completely changed. They want the planters to be punished and blacks to be protected before states were admitted to the Union. President Johnson, when he takes over after Lincoln's assassination, agrees with Lincoln in terms of the 10% plan. He believed that they were never legally outside the Union, the same thing that Lincoln had believed. And by 1865, he issued his own, May of 1865, he issued his own Reconstruction Proclamation, which disenfranchised certain leading Confederates. He did grant many pardons for former uh, Confederates. He called for special state conventions requiring the repeal of secession ordinances, the repudiation of all Confederate debts, and ratification of the 13th Amendment. He was very reluctant to agree to the 13th Amendment, but he did. And pardons of planter aristocrats soon gave many of them power to control their state organizations by the second half of 1865. So he's going to kind of move things backwards. Republicans will be outraged that the planter elite are going to be once again in control of the South. Southern reaction. Uh, white Southerners had a window of opportunity to get off easy from 1865 to 1866 because Congress was out of session. And however, their actions are going to provoke Congress's strong reaction. Former Confederate leaders will begin being elected to high officers. One, uh, the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, will become a senator from Georgia. Many Confederate generals will be elected to high offices. There will be violence against blacks that will begin in the summer of 1865. The KKK will be founded in Tennessee. And so radical republicanism um, then will be a reaction to this southern white supremacy that will emerge after this. And northerners will become convinced that Southerners had not learned their lessons because of this violence, which we'll talk more about later. There will be limits that will be placed on back Blacks by the South. It will include Black codes. These are laws that are going to try to keep a system of slavery in place and guarantee a stable, stable labor supply now that Blacks were emancipated. There will be severe penalties on Blacks that leave their labor contact, contracts there will be required to work for the same employer for a year. There will be a for potential forfeiture of wages. Um, they will also not be allowed to rent or lease land. They will not be allowed to vote. Vagrancy refers to just kind of being lazy and wandering. They should always be at work. Um, they should never be idle. Um, some are not allowed to serve on juries or testify against whites. There will be uh, marital rights granted, but few other rights. And also you're going to have a system of labor that will replace it that is sharecropping. And so many will become tenant farmers and it's really a form of indentured servitude. Yes, now they're getting paid as opposed to farming or as opposed to slavery, but they really don't have their own choice because in sharecropping, they borrow land from an owner, they give their crops to an owner and they don't have any choice.
And what really many of them wanted to do was be able to rent land, own their own crops and make choices, but they didn't. So there was no change in terms of continuity and change. There's no change in the economic lives of many slaves following the Civil War because they go from a system where they're not getting paid but working for someone else to now they're getting paid but still working for someone else and not having much choice. And the system, social system of racial superiority is still in place. The reason that many of this had been done had been to, because blacks left plantations had left shortages in labor. And so now the Republicans are furious um, at what's going on, the fact that ex-Confederates are elected to Congress. And they didn't allow Democrats you know, on the first day of the new Congress in 1865. They um, were afraid of losing their political advantage they'd had because during this Civil War, it had been an entirely Republican Congress because most of the Democrats were in the South and they had left the country. There is a larger Southern population that could potentially mean a misbalance in the House of Representatives, and they're also angry at the white supremacy. So again, this translates into how they're gonna treat people. The fears that they're gonna have are gonna make them, like I said, not want to seat the, the members of Congress. The Civil Rights Bill, of 1866 will be passed um, in response to President Johnson's reconstruction policy and his veto of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1866. Congress overturned it at the time though. The provisions of the re Civil Rights Bill gave black citizenship and attempted to destroy black codes. However, Johnson vetoed it, but Congress overturned his veto. And from the end on, Congress frequently overturned his veto. And a little bit more on it is that President Johnson's reconstruction plans largely restored pre-Civil War political, economic, and social hierarchy in the South. Freed people were denied participation in the political process. Radical Republicans, it's important to know though, never constituted a majority in their own party. Most people were moderates. And so at first, Republicans sought cooperation rather than conflict with President Johnson. But after these repeated vetoes, then they decided that they needed to react differently. So again, in the Civil Rights Act, this was the first time that the there was a national definition of citizenship that was legislated. It declared that all persons born in the United States were national citizens, except for American Indians because they were considered sovereign dependent nations. It declared all citizens were equal before the law, and it declared that all citizens, the rights of free labor, including the rights to make contracts, bring lawsuits, and have protection of their persons and property. However, President Johnson, again, vetoed this law and it became clear to moderate Republicans that he would rebuff any of their efforts to cooperate. And so this was the first time in American history that a presidential veto of a piece of major legislation had been overridden. And so the 14th Amendment is what Congress realizes needs to be imposed, is that an amendment will make it forever in the Constitution and can't be easily changed from one presidency to the next. And so it was passed in Congress in June of 1866 and is hailed by historians as the second Constitution because of the manner in which it redefined the United States as a modern nation. It enshrined the concept of birthright citizenship, meaning that if you are born on American soil, anywhere in the world, you are automatically an American citizen. It also nationalized the protection of the rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, meaning that it now applied not just to the federal government, but to the states as well. It provided for the equal protection of the law for all American citizens. It penalized states for denying any male citizen the right to vote by reducing the state's representation in Congress. It banned former rebels who held pre-war political offices from holding office again. It prohibited payments of former slaveholders in compensation for the loss of their slaves after emancipation and it prohibited the payment of debt, any debts amassed by the Confederacy. Following this, there are riots that will happen in places like Memphis and New Orleans. In Memphis, there were three days of violence in May that followed a confrontation between a former black Union soldier and Irish immigrant police. It resulted in the deaths of 48 people, 
46 of whom were black, the rape of five black women and widespread destruction. In New Orleans in July, local whites attacked about 200 African Americans. So this violence was something that showed that something else needed to be done. And the election was largely faced on this reconstruction issue. Johnson had asked the Southern states to reject the 14th Amendment as he campaigned for Democrats on his Swing Around the Circle tour. All Southern states except Tennessee rejected it. Republicans won a supermajority in House and Senate in congressional elections, and this means that they were now allowed to institute what will be known as military reconstruction. The radicals in the Senate were led by Charles Sumner and in the House by Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania. The radical Republicans sought to keep the Southern states out of the Union as long as possible and to create drastic social and economic changes in the South during this time period. So the Reconstruction Act are going to include the following measures. The South will be divided into five military districts and governed by military governors until an acceptable state constitution could be written and approved by Congress. All males, regardless of race, but excluding former Confederate leaders, were permitted to participate in the constitutional conventions that formed the new governments in each state. New state constitutions were required to provide for universal manhood suffrage, voting rights for all men without regard to race, and states were required to ratify the 14th Amendment in order to be readmitted to the Union. This did not give freedmen land or education at federal expense. And military rule will end in 1868 in all but three southern states. They did not want to make the federal government directly responsible for the protection of black rights, and this will result in a century of institutional discrimination. By Republicans in 1867 could not get Northerners to agree to suffrage for blacks in the North as racist tendencies were strong. They held a razor thin supermajority, meaning they had greater than 60%, greater than two thirds, and could not push suffrage issue in case they were voted out. So we move on to the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. And Congress had passed what was called the Tenure of Office Act in 1867. And this said that the president could not remove Senate approved appointees without the approval of the Senate. The purpose was that the Secretary of War, who had been appointed under Lincoln, his name was Edwin Stanton, and he was in the cabinet, and he was secretly serving as a spy for the radical Republicans. They wanted to provoke Johnson to break the law and then lay the foundation for impeachment. Johnson believed the act was unconstitutional, and he thought that he would have support from the Supreme Court so he fired Stanton in early 1868. Johnson did not believe the law applied to Lincoln's appointees because it had been by a previous president. In response, the House voted 126 to 47 to impeach Johnson for high cr crimes and misdemeanors as called for in the Constitution. The main issue was Johnson's violation of the Tenure of Office Act. Johnson was the only president in US history to impe be impeached until Bill Clinton in 1998. The Senate refused to remove Johnson by one vote. And that shows how important one single vote can be. And the outcome was probably beneficial for the country because Johnson's removal might have set a destructive precedent, severely weakening the executive branch. And Thomas Nass, we'll learn a little bit more about in the next unit as well. He is a famous cartoonist. and he is the one responsible for creating the symbols of the donkey and the elephant that are represented by the Democrats and the Republicans today. And on the left, you see the copperheads, uh, which is a derogatory term that we will talk about in just a second here that is going to, he's kicking the Edwin Stanton, um, who we just talked about. And this one came out after Edwin Stanton had just passed away. And it showed that the donkey um, in one of the other terms that you often hear it. And the Democrats decided just to keep it. And now they look at it more as a sure-footed animal. It's very strong. The elephant here in this one on the right 
is also seen as kind of bulldozing through and causing a lot of havoc. But today, the Republicans choose to look at it as an intelligent animal that it is. Thomas Nast is also responsible for the Americanized version of Santa Claus that we are most familiar with, as you can see here on the right. And you can see the left one is the very first one that came out in 1862, and he seems much thinner. This is Christmas during the Civil War, and on the right-hand side is 1881. So he has morphed into this jolly old fellow that we're more familiar with. Moving on to the 15th Amendment, this was passed in 1869 and ratified in 1870 during the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. The purpose was to ensure that states could guarantee suffrage if Southerners could control Congress in the future. It strengthened Republican control in Southern states and boost Republican votes in the North. The whole idea was to provide suffrage or voting rights for black males. However, there are some loopholes. It didn't say anything about holding office, so it didn't guarantee that. Voting requirements were not uniform throughout the entire country. And we have certain limits that are put on that will keep really blacks from voting as guaranteed by the 15th Amendment for 95 more years until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And these things include poll taxes, gerrymandering, grandfather clause, and literacy tests. And so starting with gerrymandering is a way that voting districts are drawn to favor one political party over the other. And this is something that is very alive and well in 2017. In fact, there's a court case going through the Supreme Court right now in one of the states that deals with gerrymandering. Because in some states, if you looked at what a district looks like, it's not a square box or even a circle or anything that remotely resembles a district. It can They can be long, stretched out for miles and look very different. The literacy tests, were a test that was given to see if they could read or write. Well, this is something that's very challenging. It goes all the way into the 1960s. And some of the things they were asked to do were to be able to name one of the Supreme Court justices, which most people today probably could not name. And it also asked them to read a portion of the Constitution, which again is very wordy and hard for most people, even literate people, to read fluently. So a literacy test was designed to get people that were not able to read or write and get them out of voting. The problem was that it could also potentially mean poor whites as well as blacks. So they instituted the poll tax, which was to pay money in order for the right to vote. Again, this could potentially get poor whites as well as poor blacks. And this will be eventually overturned later in a constitutional amendment. But in order to ensure that really it was blacks who were being limited from voting, they instituted the grandfather clause, which said that if your grandfather could vote in eight, prior to 1870, then so could you. And obviously, Blacks prior to 1870, their grandfathers could not vote. Therefore, it ensured that none of them could. There is some success with the Black representatives. You will have some individuals that will be represented in different states. So you, you will have an... an a temporary increase in the amount of black members of the House of Representatives and Congress. But you will quickly see that within a decade or so, it will start to decline again. There are, there are going to be some individuals that we need to mention here, two terms to be familiar with. And scalawags, this is a term that was coined by Southerners. And these were Southerners mostly people who supported the Union, supported Reconstruction, and they were hated by former Confederates who said that they were corrupt and they were plundering the Southern treasuries through their political influence. A carpetbagger was a Northern Republican who supposedly packed up all their belongings in a single carpetbag suitcase and came to the South to seek their fortune. It consisted of Union soldiers, teachers, and businessmen who arrived at the South before 1867 and were trying to reap the benefits of military reconstruction. They were resented by Southern whites for their federal in interference. We also have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan during this time period, and their goal was to overthrow reconstruction governments in the South and replace them with white supremacists. And many whites resented the success 
of black legislatures and also the corruption of carpet braggers and scalawags. They were founded in Tennessee in 1866 and consisted of whites from all classes in the South. They used terrorism to intimidate blacks, carpetbaggers, and scalawags. And they were effective in many areas from discouraging blacks from attaining their rights. And an important thing to understand is that there are three waves. And that was the first wave that was primarily opposed to blacks and anyone who supported them. The second wave in the 1920s is kind of an equal opportunity um, hate group because they like they dislike anyone who is not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So add to that Jews and Catholics, immigrants. They were opposed to drinkers. One of the things we'll talk about in the 1920s is wets versus dries and those that supported prohibition and didn't. Well, these individuals would support prohibition. Then in the 1950s and 60s, they will return to anti-black and anyone who supports them. The force acts were put in to counter the KKK during this time. And they're also known as the Enforcement Acts. And this used federal troops to try to put down their KKK's intimidation. This was the first time the federal government protected individuals, not local authorities. And they were moderately successful in destroying the KKK. Although, again, much of the intimidation had already been created a mental, psychological, social impact on blacks. The white supremacist solid South will rise in many states being dominated by Democrats. These, again, are not Democrats of today. These were a different kind of a group, and it's important to understand that. The remaining Republican governments in the South will collapse and pretty much be gone for about 100 years. They will not become Republican again in the South until the election of 1968 when Richard Nixon will use what's called a Southern strategy. He will go in and he will convince people that why are you voting for the Democrats? Because the Democrats in the North don't believe in the same things you believe in. We as Republicans believe in the same things that you do and he will successfully convert them. What will arise will be called known as the lost cause. This was Southern resentment and humiliation that will last for generations. And this will re result in increased violence and discrimination towards blacks. You'll also have a group known as the Redeemers, which is a coalition of pre-war Democrats, Democrats, Union Whigs, Confederate veterans, and individuals interested in industrial development. Um, they will, however, um, seek to undo um, many of the changes brought about by the Civil War and try to dismantle the reconstruction system and the policies will affect both poor and poor whites and blacks alike. The Civil Rights Act of 1865, sorry, 1875, will make it a crime for any individual to deny full and equal use of public convenient conveyances and public places such as hotels, trains, railroads, theaters, and restaurants. It will prohibit discrimination in jury selection. It did not have a strong enforcement um, mechanism as the problem. And the Northerners will become dismayed when it is overturned by the Supreme Court in 1883, and they will not really try another Civil Rights Act for almost, almost 90 years. The end of Reconstruction. By 1870, all former Confederate states had reorganized their state governments and been reintegrated into the Union, having adopted both the 14th and 15th Amendments. Once the state government seemed on solid footing, Union forces were removed. By 1876, whites again dominated Southern politics and Northerners were concerned with other issues besides helping freedmen. There was a panic in 1873 that lasted until 1879 that focused people instead on economic issues. This will lead to the Compromise of 1877. In the election of 1877, Rutherford B. Hayes is the Republican, Samuel Tilden is the Democrat. Tilden will lead the popular vote and win the Electoral College with 184 votes compared to 165. The problem was that you needed 187 votes to win, so he was just three votes shy. There were 20 electoral votes in question due to fraud and violence in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Plus, there were questions of voter eligibility in Oregon. 15 member, a 15-member commission 
is going to be appointed, which will eventually give Hayes all 20 of the votes. The Democrats will filibuster, meaning that they will attempt to bring keep this from actually becoming a vote. The compromise will be that the North will be allowed to have Hayes as the president, but in return, the last federal troops that remained would be removed from South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. So military reconstruction will officially end at this time. The results of military reconstruction do include the amendments, the 14th and 15th amendments. There will be a decline in presidential power that will happen over the next several decades in the era that we will come to talk about next time period, which is known as the Gilded Age, when Congress and big business will hold much more power and presidents will be weak and ineffective. And often they're known as the forgotten presidents for a reason. There will be property rights for women that will be included during this time period. And the property rights will be eliminated for holding office from any of the places that they hadn't previously. There will be some public schools that will be created. The tax system will be improved. There will be public works launched in transportation, especially. And so there are some positives that came out of military reconstruction for sure. Post civil, post reconstruction, there are some civil rights challenges. Um, reconstruction had failed to empower blacks politically. There will be open disregard for the 14th and 15th amendments, as I have previously mentioned. There will be the problems of sharecropping that will become a wide scale practice that will keep the blacks tied to plantation owners. What's known as crop lien laws will um, basically bind them and make them unable to pay off their debts. And then we have the slaughterhouse cases of 1873, which was still during Reconstruction. And the 14th Amendment had protected against federal infringement of privileges and immunities, not state infringements. And so states were able to discriminate against their citizens is basically what that means. And so this will mold the interpretation of the 14th Amendment for decades. There will be some additional cases that's not listed here. The civil rights cases of 1883. The court will claim that the 14th Amendment protects individuals from state action, not individual action, which will overturn the Civil Rights Act of 1875. It will discourage Congress from passing civil rights law until 1957. There will be wholesale disenfranchisement and beginning in 1890 through again, the poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses. There will be Jim Crow laws um, established in 1890 that are segregation in public facilities. There will be lynchings that will arise as a form of intimidation or hangings that will be at an all time high by 1884 and, and mob rule will exist. And we'll talk a lot about that in the next unit particularly. One final thing to discuss is what's known as historiography. And this is basically the interpretation that is made by historians. And one of the first is known as the Dunning School and it's named after William A. Dunning, who was a Columbia historian. And it's related to the lost cause philosophy and will help to sustain racial segregation. And I'm gonna read you a quote that is from historian Eric Foner, who's a contemporary um, historian writing today, describing basically the school of thought. According to this view, the vindictive radical wing of the Republican party, motivated by hatred of the South, overturned the lenient plans for national reunion designed by Abraham Lincoln and his successor, his successor Andrew Johnson, and imposed black suffrage on the defeated Confederacy. There followed a sordid period of corruption and misrule, the argument went, presided over by unscrupulous political opportunists from the North, derisively termed carpetbaggers, Southern whites who had abandoned their racial and regional loyalties to cooperate with the ra radical Republicans, known as scalawags, and the former slaves who had, were allegedly unprepared for the freedom that had been thrust upon them and unfit for participation in government. Eventually, organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan, deemed patriotic by proponents of this interpretation, overthrew this misgovernment and restored home rule, a euphemism for white supremacy to the South. So this Dunning School is closely related to the mythology that I previously mentioned of the lost cause. And it's something that's still discussed today. And this is that it takes a nostalgic view of antebellum or pre-Civil War South. 
holding that disagreements over states' rights rather than slavery was the central cause of the war, that slave society was something that was harmonious, even for enslaved people, and that Southerners were a brave and noble people who were defeated in what amounted to an unfair fight because of the numbers and resources of the Union military. According to this philosophy and the lost cause, groups like the KKK were heroes in the Reconstruction era for fighting fighting to restore noble society destroyed by war. So again, this, this school of thought will eventually be discredited heavily, although there are some people in some parts of this country that this is the only philosophy that they've heard. Um, so that's why it's really important to read and understand multiple different historians. And this will create and sustain the system of racial segregation that I mentioned previously. The school, the Dunning School and the Lost Cause will also have a effect on popular culture. And there was a novel called The Klansman by Thomas Dixon. And it was turned into a three hour silent film that glorified the KKK as saviors of the South from the freed people, portraying them as brutish and bestial. And this is known as the birth of a nation. And this was something that was released in 1915. So after this time period, but Woodrow Wilson, who will become one of our presidents, will write a book and he will describe it as the white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern economy country. Wilson praised the movie and made it the first film ever to be screened at the White House. The same year, the KKK will reemerge across the country to terrorize African Americans and immigrants. So, understanding the Dunning School, the Lost Cause philosophy, and the birth of a nation can help you to understand modern day discussions about the issue of Confederate monuments and why some people are so adamant that these should not be taken down and that Robert E. Lee was a hero and that they are so strong in their belief that the confederate flag is a symbol of heritage not a symbol of racism because they've grown up with this idea of we were fighting for a noble cause it was about states right it had nothing to do with slavery now there will be challenges to the dunning school beginning um in 1913 one will be published um in important one is wb dubois who will learn about later on next unit writes a book called Black Reconstruction in America and start, start, seeks to talk about setting the historical record state, straight, but also talking about the fact of propaganda and its uses in history and what it can do to people understanding. But at the same time, the public was enthralled with a new movie that was released known as Gone with the Wind. And this helps to glorify this old Southern philosophy of the South as this, law, again, lost cause philosophy. And then it will finally be in the 1960s with the civil rights movement that the real discredita discreditation will begin to happen. And that is it for Reconstruction. We will move on and be talking a little bit about, in the next unit, about how Reconstruction is leading to some more of these issues with um, the concerns over blacks and whites and black codes and some of the legal things that are going to happen just in the period following this. But that is the end of this presentation.